Should I start? Sure. All right, well, um, hello everyone, and uh, thanks to Francesca for inviting us to this workshop. Um, so a few words about myself and, um, and the research that I'm doing. Uh, my name is Inanna Hamati Ataya. I'm Principal Research Associate uh, at the Center for Research in the Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities, CRASH, uh, here at Cambridge. Um, and I'm also the founding director of the Center for Global Knowledge Studies, uh, which is part of my European Research Council um, grant project. So I'm, I'm going to be talking a bit about this uh, project to give you an idea of the kind of interdisciplinary um, parameters and, and considerations that you uh, might want to think about if you're developing interdisciplinary research. Um, I'm also involved with the Global Food Security Interdisciplinary Research Center. And in that capacity, I've developed um, small projects with Francesca uh, and other collaborators in the center that uh, involve also interdisciplinary research, um, interdisciplinary conversations that uh, have led us to apply for different kinds of funding, smaller grants um, that also are very different from these big uh, excellent science uh, research projects. So I will say a bit more also about the kinds of interdisciplinary parameters for these particular grants. Um, so let me start with the, the basics. If you are developing um, a project that you know is very, is either multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, it's very important that uh, you define the parameters for your own work and the parameters for the work of your team members. Um, and I think there is a very important distinction here because the project itself might be multidisciplinary and very integrative, but that doesn't mean that every member of the team is going to be um, doing interdisciplinary work. So when you design the project, uh, you have to decide the extent to which um, your team members are going to be experts in a particular field or whether you want them to have a wider, uh, a multidisciplinary range. Um, and, and you also have to make sure that the kinds of profiles you're looking for actually exist. So I think that if you have never had such an experience before, you might just be thinking in very abstract terms. But then when you come to recruit people, you will find uh, that most people, like most of us, are socialized within particular disciplines. And especially if they're young, um, fresh graduates, they will have graduated from a particular department and their work will be focused within a particular field. So even if they're interested in pursuing research within that field in your team, in your interdisciplinary project, they might not be socialized into the other fields that are relevant uh, to the project that you want to develop. So you end up recruiting uh, the best people for a particular work package, for a particular research question, but then this means that you have to make up for that loss of expertise um, in terms of what you were originally expected. So try to incorporate this when you're designing a research project. You have to be ready to uh, work with people who are from very different backgrounds, who might not um, understand or, or engage with all the different research questions and with a, you know, with a general um, objective of the project, but you have to learn to pick them in such a way that you can delegate um, to them particular work packages, particular, uh, I don't know if you're from the sciences, particular experiments uh, or um, methodologies or parts of the research, if it's ethnographic work or lab work, etc. cetera. Um, so delegating is a very important part. You have to make sure that um, you are relying on the strengths of your team members. So that's another thing. If you're not very good at delegating, you have to learn to do that. Um, whether it's about, you know, trusting them to collect data or trusting them to analyze data or even to, you know, to make more important strategic choices within the, the project. It's very important that you have some leeway and that you discuss all these issues with them. If you're recruiting people from very different uh, backgrounds, as, as I did, um, it's very useful also to not only get them to become more familiar with the contours and the parameters of the project, even if they're not contributing 
to its different aspects, but also get them to talk to each other and to try and, and identify, um, you know, some complementarities in their perspectives or, or if they come from very different fields, uh, where they might intersect in their research interests or how they might complement uh, one another's expertise. Um, so the more you can develop these kinds of integrative conversations, the better it is for your project, even if uh, you're the only one who's actually involved in all the different dimensions and, and having this overview of, you know, of how the project is going and what you need uh, to be done. So this is my main, um, um, my main piece of advice if you are a principal investigator, if you're developing a project that is substantially multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary, is to think really well about the, you know, where the interdisciplinarity lies. If, it's, if it lies at the, you know, the, the methodological level and the conceptual level, and if, it's, if it rests mainly on your own shoulders, then that's fine. But it means that you need to pick your team members in a way um, where they fit within very clearly delineated roles and, and fields of expertise. But if you want to develop a fully interdisciplinary research team, then you also have to have a sense of whether that is feasible. Um, you have to perhaps, before submitting the, 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 the research proposal, um, you know, do some scoping to, know, to, to, to look for these people, to see whether they exist actually, whether these profiles exist, whether it's possible to recruit them. Uh, if, if you can identify specific people, it's even better to actually include them nominally in, in the research project and to have a substantial discussion with them so that their perspective also informs the way that you develop uh, the project and its methodology. So you have to think before that of the kind of interdisciplinarity that you're going to deploy and who is going to carry it. Now, for the uh, smaller kinds of grants that I mentioned, so like the ones that I've developed with the GFS and with Francesca, um, this is not about delegation. It's really about uh, bringing in um, uh, and coordinating different kinds of expertise uh, and establishing different conversations. So here it's much more of a lateral um, kind of process where you have to try and find you know, intersections uh, and build on, on, on each other's strengths and perspectives. So this is much, <clears throat> much more of a collaborative work from the very start when you are uh, thinking about you know, the, the kind of activities that you want to develop, uh, the kinds of people you want to bring in. So here I'm talking about um, you know, these um, funding applications for impact grants, for example, um, outreach or communication-based research, etc., where you're not the principal investigator, but you are coordinating or you are a co-investigator with someone from a completely different field. This requires a much more integrative kind of work uh, and background work from the beginning. Um, and I think that you need to work with people that you already know um, and perhaps develop out of a core collaboration, uh, develop more of a, a networking uh, strategy to bring in other people. So with Francesca, for example, each of us uh, has their own networks. Um, and then once we start thinking together, you know, we, we, each of us brings a completely different palette uh, of people, of ideas, of methods, of perspectives, etc. So there are two very different ways of thinking about interdisciplinary work. Um, when you are your own um, boss and, and, and the whole enterprise rests on, on your own thinking and your own objectives, you have to think of the kind of team you want to develop when you are collaborating, well, the thinking starts with the collaborators. So, so this is something that evolves much more and much more rapidly. Uh, and so I think that you, can, you should start with a, with a less structured uh, conversation if you're doing this with collaborators. Whereas if you're developing your own project, you really need to think a lot and, and design a lot and think and, and try to anticipate the kinds of issues that you might um, confront because of the interdisciplinary nature of the project. And so I, I recommend actually that you, that you speak with many people who 
uh, have developed such projects because we learn also by doing. So submitting a proposal and getting funding is just, it's just, it's the beginning of the story. But then uh, you realize that the, even the interdisciplinary scope of the project might shift completely. Uh, mine has extended. I thought it was very interdisciplinary when I, when I proposed it. By the time I got to the interview in the second round, um, the project was maybe twice as interdisciplinary as it was. And now it has exploded completely to the point that uh, I, I, I don't even list the different fields uh, that are involved. So it's, it's something that uh, expands a lot. And at some point you don't even think in terms of interdisciplinarity, you're just following the interesting stuff uh, wherever it leads you and you learn a lot you become familiar with different approaches and methodologies uh, and you recognize the kinds of experts that, that you, can, you can go to, uh, to to become better socialized in, in the methods and the tools that you need. So these were my main points for today's uh, discussion. Thank you, Nana. That, that was really, really, really great, very useful. And before Passing on to John, I wanted to ask you a very quick question now, and then we can open the floor. Um, how do you then <clears throat> ensure that you know all these people? Because we, we researchers tend to, to be quite isolated often, they don't really mix, even within their own departments often. So, you know, in a way, I'm kind of thinking <clears throat> IRCs like us should really try to do their best and create these connections, right? And kind of build groups and networks when then people have heard about so and so, and then when the opportunity comes, they'll get together because otherwise it must be quite, quite tricky, right? You take them off the, you know, off the internet, probably not. What's your best advice about that? Well, um, before the pandemic, <laughs> I would have, of course, um, uh, um, exploited all opportunities to meet people in person. I think Cambridge is a really extraordinary place to do that. Uh, if you're affiliated with a college, you already have, you're already in a very interdisciplinary environment where people, you know, the conversations are never set by a particular discipline. You know, you're just interested in the same things and, and, and you get to talk. And this opens up horizons in, in, in intellectual and, and practical terms as well, because someone will say, oh, you, know, you have to meet this person who's working in engineering and this person who's in linguistics, et cetera. Um, but more generally, if you don't have this access, I think that you should not be shy and really go towards the people, you know, gravitate towards the, the, the fields that interest you. Um, I, I started using different strategies, for example, subscribing to journals that I would never have thought of following before. Uh, I follow many um, Twitter accounts, for example, institutional accounts and accounts of academics that are from very different fields. And I, I stay up to date on, you know, on, um, on what's going on and the latest uh, and the most advanced research. I contact people. Sometimes they are PhD students. Uh, I learned that they're doing, you know, fantastic doctoral work or they've just graduated or, um, you know, I've, I've, I've read a book or an article. You know, you, I think you have to, you have to take this initiative. If, if you want to reach out to people, you should reach out to people. And, uh, and in my experience, um, you know, sometimes they are looking for someone to actually connect from a different perspective. Uh, so, so I, I think that's the only way to do it. If you're not already in an, in an environment that is giving you that kind, you know, these kinds of opportunities and you have to create them yourself. You have to be creative and quite sort of outgoing. Thank, thank you, Nana. So we, John, would you like to share your experience and, um, maybe also look at the, um, money side as well. <laughs> As you yeah. mentioned before, uh, and then we could, open up to questions and discussion. Absolutely. Uh, could I uh, put some slides on the screen? Here we are. Okay, let's see if I can. 
Okay, um, I'm not sure if you can uh, see my slides, can you? And can you see the cursor wiggling around? Great. A lot of, uh, it was very interesting uh, listening uh, to your talk, you know, because I think a lot of the things I say actually in a different context reflect many of the points. Uh, so I'm looking over there because that's where your picture is. But, uh, oh, put in the middle. There we are. Um, so they reflect many of the points uh, that you made. So I suppose I should just introduce myself. So my name's John Carr, and uh, I'm a, a lecturer in the Department of uh, Plant Sciences. And I run a, a research group called Virology and Molecular Plant Pathology. So until um, I'd say 2010, I had done a collaborative work, but I'd never done it internationally. So in this very brief, I hope, uh, series of slides, I'll just talk about, I'll focus on the sort of international perspective and uh, specifically with international collaborations with low and medium income country scientists uh, in Africa rather than uh, ones with, with other countries. Um, and I, I'm just putting the funding acknowledgements, it's sort of traditional to do, but it's also, you notice there's lots of different ones. And some of them um, we got an awful lot of money from at one go, and others we got little bits. And all of these things were valuable, and you have to sort of just keep plugging away and getting everything, because everything can sort of bridge and keep you, keep you going over, over time when things are maybe a bit thinner, when you want to try something new with new people. Uh, I've also, I don't usually put pictures of myself um, in, in, but this is really just to um, say that when you engage with a new partnership and a new problem that you're maybe not so familiar with really, um, that it's really good to visit them and go out of your way and work with them, even if it's only for a couple of weeks of, in this case, field work and I'm isolating uh, or grinding up uh, insects called aphids um, in this little, little tube to collect for uh, something called uh, deep uh, sequencing, the genomics. And you get to meet people, but also you get to really understand their landscape, their problems, uh, what, what the issues are. And it's much better than sort of taking a grand view and sending a student down by themselves. In this case, I was with a a student so we both got to learn quite a lot this was in west africa i took a student from east africa he'd never been there and he got a lot as much out of it i think as i got coming from europe okay so i'm only going to describe two projects in minimal detail and then say what the ramifications of these projects were so the first one is a big one so this was the the first uh, major collaborative grant uh, I got um, to work in sub-Saharan Africa. And so it was two million pounds. I'll give you information on something at the other end of the, the spectrum in a moment. So the importance of, of the problem was that uh, common bean uh, is an important source of protein and income, especially for women and therefore for children in the region. And it's it, you know, brings in some money into the household for education, uh, medicine, etc. What we were trying to address was that uh, viruses transmitted by these insects called aphids um, are causing major losses for this particular crop for common bean, and the aphids love to accumulate on the uh, the flowering and podding uh, plants. So the purpose of bringing together um, actually three groups, my own group, an epidemiology group run by Professor Chris Gilligan, John Pickett's group at Rothamsted Research and David Balcom to look at the genomics aspects, along with my colleagues in Nairobi at a place called Becker and colleagues at SEAT was to try and understand what viruses, the population structure of the viruses, improve mathematical epidemiological approaches to understand insect transmitted diseases and to ultimately come up with some novel um, ways of, of attacking it, of the problem. 
Um, and anyway, I should say we thought this was the purpose of the collaboration, but later I'm going to say I don't think that was the purpose of the collaboration at all. I was wrong. The other uh, collaboration I'd just like to highlight was a much smaller one. I think it was probably overall a bit more than 100,000, but this was about three or four different grants from different sources. Uh, working uh, with my friend Ken Fenning, who works at the University of Ghana. And uh, he uh, is addressing a problem for cabbages. Now, okay, cabbages, uh, if they're all, all wiped out in, in Ghana, people won't starve, but they will lose an awful lot of income. So it's very important for smallholders. Uh, and you have this remarkable disease that you start off with a nice, healthy cabbage crop, uh, this one is being planted in an area where the disease is particularly pre prevalent and about four weeks later the plants are dead and th this disease is associated with a buildup of of aphids so we worked with uh, ken to sort of bring molecular biology tools to identify the aphids try and characterize what the virus is um but i'd just like to highlight here's a student who traveled with me to, to kenya in that particular case francis is from uh, sorry, travelled to Ghana, he's from Kenya, uh, and there's Ethel, and she's actually from Cameroon, but working in, in Ghana. And in a way, perhaps it's the students who are the major uh, output from uh, this project, apart from, you know, three or so research papers and, and further funding. So this is what I'm trying to sort of say, that maybe the actual scientific data isn't always the main output. But first, um, so this is this project, which is very large, and this is just an acronym for the particular program we applied to. And over on this side uh, is that much smaller series of, um, of projects. So by working on this, we got another very large grant from the GCRF uh, to apply some of the, the, the data that we got from the first project to see if we could come up with innovative uh, plant mixtures that would inhibit the transmission of diseases. Um, the technician on, in Uganda was so good that we invited him to apply for a Cambridge Africa PhD studentship. Um, I'll come back to him in a moment. And uh, we parlayed some of the discoveries that we, we, we had into other grants. But as I said, it's the, the human product. So Warren was a, a, a technician uh, on the original project. Uh, He's now completed his PhD. He's going to work for CG as a more in the CG system at a more senior position. Um, we don't really work with Geraldine anymore. She was the first postdoc on this project, but now she's the Minister of Agriculture in Rwanda. So um, I guess I guess that's impact, is it? Uh, but the postdoc, the second postdoc from that project, uh, then collaborated on this project. Now he has his own position, and we have our own grant together. And Francis Wamonje was a PhD student on this project, and now uh, he then became a, a Royal Society Flair Fellow, um, and he's also a co-I on, on a couple of grants, grants with me. But the main thing is, um, although 10 years ago when I started doing it, I thought, well, the main thing is to you know, solve all the problems of crop disease uh, using molecular biology tools, I think actually the major success has been people and creating a network which i think was a point that uh Inanna was making so just to come to funding and so on so i'm sort of a um, a not very good epidemiologist and in epidemiology when we're giving lectures on it we sometimes use this concept of the disease triangle and usually you'll have the pathogen there the host there, the environmental conditions there. And if they're all present, then you'll get disease. So I've changed it into a collaboration triangle. So there's your skills, and then there's the complementary skills of collaborators, and then there's the funding climate. Now, like any other scientist or, or academic, I'm a, uh, a consistent moaner and complainer about the funding situation, uh, none of funding. But I'd say of all these different things, well, you can always pretend to certain skills. 
Mm, okay, well, you have to look out for what grant calls there are or what programs are available. But again, I think revisiting something that Inanna was talking about, which is that really it's gathering this network of collaborators, which is the hardest step. And this is particularly hard at the beginning, but then maybe as your collaboration builds, you realize that some people are more collaborative than others. Uh, they also have their own networks. You have your networks. Sometimes you actually see new networks that don't involve you being built. And sometimes you find yourself working with different people. So um, that's, that's it really. Um, how do I get this? <laughs> oh, I have to stop sharing, I guess. Um, so that's, that's it really. I just want to say how you start off with a collaboration. If it's successful, I think the main mark of success, it gives rise to other collaborations. It benefits the people you work with. And um, basically the, the, the rate limiting step is getting that initial group of collaborators together. Then if you do it properly and you work as it were nicely with people so that they, you try and understand their problems as well as you know, you're trying to direct things, uh, then the network sort of starts to build itself beyond that point. Sorry, Francesca, I interrupted you. No, 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 please. Thank you, John. That was great. Um, I, I, I have a few questions, but I'd like to, to uh, start the discussion. Well, perhaps actually I will ask you, John, and Nana, a quick question and then see what people also uh, think. How do you then draft an application that convinces the funder that uh, you have actually a good project and is going to have impact, which is one, one of the major things that uh, funders now obviously look at, or always, probably, or, or always had, but particularly now. How do you sort of, what, what would you say are the sort of the key things that, you, that <clears throat> somebody who start drafting, working on an application should, should look? My, my own view, it is that you actually need to read the, if it's a particular call, you need to read that very carefully uh, and understand what really what they're, they're getting at. And then actually be willing not to go for a call if you realize, it, you know, you don't have a fit. Um, it doesn't mean you don't circulate it to other people who, who might be better. Uh, like I said, the, the, the first collaboration in, in this area was, was the hardest to set up. And uh, it really uh, occurred, there was a, a call for a workshop um, at uh, Biosciences East Africa in Nairobi. Um, and it was partly run by NSF, uh, the US uh, funding agency, partly by BBSLC, a UK funding agency, and partly by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and um, I happened to have a bit of data that might, might have been relevant to the call uh, and so I applied just to see what would happen and I, I went there and that was very useful. It, it was a very good workshop. It brought together a lot of people and the call was very specific uh, dealing with crop diseases in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but I didn't actually know anything about crop diseases in southern in sub-Saharan Africa, nothing at all. All I had was some uh, lab-based experience experiments looking at the effect uh, or the interactions of virus infected plants and insects uh, but it looked like it might be useful and so as a result uh, of that initial um, workshop I did meet an, a number of people and it somewhat took off from from though I, I mean I, I don't know I could comment on on the style of the uh, of the workshop there were elements of it, um, Gates tends to organize these workshops. And if you're lucky enough to sort of vaguely weigh in or when they, they invite you, um, they're very keen on something which I guess is in business or tech or whatever. And you just stand there in front of a, a flip chart and sort of pitch your idea. And, and my honest opinion of that is it's terrible. Because um, it, People, unless you're a real showman 
Um, and maybe maybe man is appropriate here as well, you know, unless you sort of got that sort of weird personality. It it really doesn't it doesn't work very well. A number like this, and I, I just see it again and again. And at the end of this workshop, most people have been taken off on a little excursion, and a couple of us uh, gave more conventional short seminars. And then suddenly there was a tension because we actually showed our data, we showed our findings, and then people could see what we we're talking about, not some very badly drawn pictures of insects on a, a flip chart. Um, so overall, I think that work, those sort of workshops that they, they run are very, very good. But some of their methodology, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. Mm. Thank you, John. Anyone has questions, uh, comments? Please, and let's let's open the discussion. Um, open your mics if you would like to ask a question, of course. Anyone? Alison, I think have you unmuted yourself? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. They are really informative talks. A lot of information. Thank you. Um, I've got lots of questions, but I'll keep it. I'll keep it to a short question, which would probably be easy for you to to to, to let us know. But also, the second question is about cost. My first question is really um, the differentiation between interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary, which were mentioned. Um, I've certainly in in I, I I have little success. I written a few collaborative grants myself but not not so much of the successes yet um but i i have been picked up on multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary i wondered how you define that um and I, secondly the cost to stop the cost um the trouble is with um interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary collaborations maintaining a, a, a re realistic cost below a budget um is quite tricky in from from a from a person who's starting at the bottom for the first time, um, I wonder whether how you approach that. Um, partly, I've been told before by um, experienced people that um, if you're an early career um, researcher, you should keep costs well below budget levels because that's more value for money and more realistic. If you're going, for example, for a new investigator or something like that, so I just wondered if you could answer either of you could answer anything on, along those lines. First. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Do, do, do you want to go, Inanna? Inanna, yeah, Inanna, would you like to take the first question? Intro? Well, I, I think I'm the one who confused everyone with the inter, multi and, and trans. No, but it's true, it's true. The, the words that are used commonly, right? Yes. Um, well, I should say that many people use them interchangeably, so you shouldn't be too worried about, you know, the differences. Um, in, I, I use transdisciplinary because um, the, the questions that interest me are not simply, you know, you can't just break them down into different disciplines. So it's not just about accumulating different perspectives with different methodologies. There's, there's more of an in, integrative or integrating uh, approach. Um, and so the innovation in the project was in, in precisely the way that the research question actually, you know, cannot be answered in, in, a, in a fragmented way. So I use that term precisely because it, it actually doesn't start from the disciplines. Um, it starts really from a particular object and a particular question. And then I have to go and, and, and deploy and mobilize and learn how to, how to understand it from very different angles. So, so it's really, it depends on your project, what it is, what the questions you're asking are. And then it depends, of course, on the kind of grant that you're applying for. Uh, so some grants are, they have the parameter within them already. So they might tell you that, the, you know, it has to be interdisciplinary. And so you have to go and understand what they mean by that. And I agree with John that you have to carefully read these schemes and you have to really carefully decide whether you really you know whether this is really for you so there's a whole bunch of schemes that i don't even look at 
because I know they're not for me. And I know that, you know, um, I don't want to format my own, my project to fit within particular parameters. So you have to find the, 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 the scheme that is right for you. Sometimes it's vague enough for you to develop your project within that. And then you have to spell out, you know, if the parameters are not there, you have to spell out what you mean by interdisciplinary and people usually don't care as long as you're coherent. So, um, you know, reviewers are usually open-minded. The, the more prestigious the grant, the more transparent the procedure, uh, the more the experts are open-minded. And so they really want to assess your project on your own terms. So you have to, you have to define it. Um, some, some terms and some concepts are perhaps um, too extreme. So I used to, you know, to say post-disciplinary and someone told me, no, 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 that's too early. So I reverted to transdisciplinary because there's no point in, in you know, triggering all, all these alarms because it simply defeats the purpose. You want to communicate efficiently to people and you want to bring people in. So if you're telling them, you know, your disciplines are too little or they don't matter, that's not a way of bringing people in. So, so yeah, the words are, are not important in one way and in another they're important if, if you use them well or if you avoid um, these issues. Um, in, uh, some grants do not require you to be interdisciplinary, but if your project is, you really need to show. So in Francesca's question earlier, how, how do you show it? Uh, it could be at the level of the methodology. It could be in the way that you apply some, you know, a methodology developed within one field and you're innovatively applying it to a different field, but in a way that is actually robust or interesting. It could be in combining very different kinds of approaches to the same object. So there are many fields now that are naturally interdisciplinary because they require a combination of, you know, archaeology, genetics, uh, linguistics, climatology, um, demography, etc. And so basically, the the very nature of the kind of analysis or explanation that they have to produce requires the you know the the involvement of all these people who are going to analyze one part and without that part you cannot present a whole you know a whole narrative about what happened in that particular archaeological site so it really depends on on what you're doing as long as it's robust uh, i think you should always be coherent with your own project, do it on your own terms, and if it is robust, it will be convincing. In terms of costs, um, well, you have to work within the budget. So um, if you're applying for a 1 million euro grant, for example, a, a European Research Council starting grant, I think it's 1 or 1.5 million euros, um, you have to know exactly what you can do with that. If you're bringing people in as me team members, then you have to count their salaries. You can bring them in as full timers or not. So if you don't have too much money, you can decide, for example, do, do you want them on a part time basis? Can they work only for six months on the project, etc. Um, but it has to be feasible. It has to work out. You, you, you cannot just have someone be, an, you know, contribute an essential thing, but only be there two hours a week. So the costs, these are, I, I don't know of open-ended uh, budget kinds of, gra of grants. I don't know, maybe the Gates Foundation has that, but all the others, you have a very strict budget and you sort of have to work it backwards. So you have to take out, you know, the overheads or whatever, your salary comes first. Uh, whatever is essential to the project, equipment, et cetera. And then whatever you're left with, you have to come up with a formula. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you hire PhD students, uh, this has very good pedagogical value. You're training also um, new people. It costs you less, um, especially if they're home students and you benefit someone, you're giving them the chance to continue their postgraduate education. Um, so this can be a way of doing it. If you need someone full time, if you need someone who doesn't necessarily bring a high, an advanced level of expertise, but who can go and, you know, um, collect data and, and, and focus on one particular aspect. Um, 
yeah so but you have to think i would say one of the one of the lessons i've learned with my uh Euro european um, um grants um is that it's good to to think ahead <clears throat> or to talk to people who have had the experience and anticipate the kinds of things that you will want to do over let's say it's a five four year project i didn't i didn't think that i would be interested in public engagement that i would be interested in you know doing lots of things producing videos as i've done for the global food security um, so I ended up in this absurd situation where I have a 1.5 million euro grant, but I'm applying for 1,000 pounds from the Newton Trust to be able to organize a panel at the Cambridge you know, Festival of Science and bring in two speakers and I don't know what. So that's really absurd because you're spending a lot of time developing small grant applications, but at the same time, they're important and you cannot spend the grant you have because you haven't budgeted that originally so the costs you you have to make choices but sometimes um small small you know big choices can do not necessarily cost a lot but they can make a big difference um so it's important to talk also always very very important to talk to whoever is in charge in your unit because they will know um they will know the tricks and they will know the rules um but yeah you well you if you have that much money you can you can you can do you know that kind of project but you can also have lots of money and not do anything i mean it's um it's not necessarily the the most you know costly research i mean in the sciences a lot of it goes into equipment and and, and materials etc of course in the social sciences two million you you're just you know you're living the the intellectual life in in, in the best condition so yeah I, I hope that answered both questions thank you now Alison are you yeah yeah are you happy with that? thank you yes thank you I think um it has answered quite a lot of the question I think um you know cost is is the main thing I think it's easy to get wrapped up in in um you know conversations as coming from a lower end talking to people who are very senior you can get very much involved with the money that you have to pay them for supervision for example or whatever and i think that's right. quite mm -hmm. but ayana isn't it also a little bit and maybe john can also answer this question um isn't it a little bit of a catch to do in a way because you wanted to make it very disciplinary and to make it interdisciplinary we need to bring in lots of people but then of course all these people cost so so then you end up thinking okay we have to limit the amount of people and therefore the interdisciplinarity into the project is this something that you you have to deal with as well or how do you overcome this this issue well in my current project i i i sort of you, you know carry the burden of the interdisciplinary framework so i did i never said what the project was about but i'm looking at um the evolution of human agricultural knowledges for the past 13,000 years and how this has shaped global, what we call world systems. So political major societal and political patterns of you know, political governance, et cetera. Um, and, I, and so I hired two postdocs. One of them is a historian of science of a particular era in British genetics, and, but focused on agriculture. And another one was a political scientist focused on international relations and social movements of farmers. And it, when they first met, they didn't know, you know, what to talk to each other about because they didn't think they had anything in common. Um, and I didn't think that was particularly a problem, but that, but, 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 you know, they don't together cover the interdisciplinary range. So that, that's sort of me in my head. Um, now I'm developing a similar but bigger a project where I'm thinking I, I would like to expand the team and that's a problem because the money is not enough. So I'm trying to find innovative ways of bringing people. So deciding who really are necessary as core team members um, and how, you know, and whether I can bring them full time or, you know, and at what rank. So I'm sort of playing with the, <laughs> with the, with the values to see whether, you know, someone is senior, you cannot hire them as a lecturer or at lecturer rank uh, with a PhD student be able to do that work, etc. But more importantly, um, I think you can develop 
non-budget related ways, non-costly ways of, of having collaborations that feed into the project. So I'm doing this through, that's why I created my center actually, which, which was part of the project. I said, I want to develop an interdisciplinary space where we can study the history and philosophy and politics of knowledge and science and technology, regardless of the fields that we're from and regardless of, you know, the historical period, etc. So I developed this space, which doesn't cost us much, um, but it has attracted so many people. We have more than 70 associate members now. Um, I initiated research groups within it. So these are, these are people who exist and the conversations are going on. And so you can integrate them into your project without them having a, 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 you know, a financial tag because they're not hired but they are part of the environment. And I think that you can make the case um, that you are collaborating with clusters of people. You can establish structures that are not, you know, institutionalized. Uh, so you, you don't, you can talk to people that you're not recruiting. You can talk to people who are not hired. Um, so, yeah. It, I don't know. Yeah. If you're limited by the budget, then... <coughs> you have to think about the best way to do things makes sense um so yeah that would be my my answer john you also had uh, your hand raised and then lucia has a question well i i, ha I had some uh, additional advice for allison but uh, maybe she could get in touch with me i think uh, lucia has been waiting long enough so <laughs> thank um, you well, yeah, thanks both. I thought it was a really, uh, both really interesting presentations. Um, so I'm, I'm interested uh, in some of the new investigator awards for UK research councils, and I'm interested in interdisciplinary research. But I just wondered if you had any tips and tricks of, you know, how do you pitch interdisciplinary research to a research council without them saying, oh, this is out of scope? or whether you think actually it's about choosing the right call in the first place and interdisciplinary research works better for responsive calls? Um, I think very often um, specific calls uh, are better for interdisciplinary research. Uh, and again, deal with the caution, carefully read the instructions before uh, operating. Um, but if, for example, if you're looking at a, a responsive mode call and if you look at your particular research council and if one of the priority areas you know the standing priority areas or highlight areas or whatever is to disciplinary research and especially if they define it a bit then that 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 can be good um, they change regularly so um, it's not a bad idea to keep uh, an eye on the ukri um, you know website just to see what I don't know which um, which research council sub research council would you be going for? Uh, EPSRC. Yeah, so you just you know at, at the moment I'm not sure. So I tend to go for sort of BBSRC type things. So I'm not sure it's really a a key area at the moment. Um, so the um, the the sort of statements that they have do change, and they change a lot when there's a new um, you know research council. Uh, boss, uh, and they change a lot if there's a bit of churn in the uh, the various uh, research committees with within that uh, research council. Um, so that's in terms of you know what what flies best. I think just keep keep an eye out for specific calls, but also keep an eye on what what the highlight areas are. Um, just reflecting on something that Alison was was asking before. Um, the head some people have a hesitancy uh, about asking for what they need now uh, now i doubt she did address that but i'd say i just reiterate if you need something and you can justify it and on ukri uh, grant applications they have a specific document called justification of resources if you are able to justify that uh, to the grant then you you should um ask for it, you ask for what you need, um, and again, partly addressing Alison's question, it's sort of when whatever agency it is, whether it's the EU or UKRI or something else, um, 
have competing um, research applications, which they normally would, that committee wants to rank them. And if you're at the top or close to the top of the ranking and you're likely to get funded and then you get funded, you will be kicking yourself if you ask for what you really, uh, really needed. Um, so ask for what you need. I don't think it will actually decrease your, as long as you don't go over the, the limit, it, it won't actually damage you. I know that wasn't your specific question, but it, it was just something I think people think, I think it's a very British mindset. Think, oh, well, maybe if I don't ask for too much, they'll look at that and they'll think, oh, all right, that's okay. But, you know, really, it's like if, if the reviews and uh, are, you know, say nice things about it. And then if the nowadays on the UKRI panel, the three people uh, who need to speak primarily for it all by some miracle or like it too, you know, it'll get funded. But if you underfund yourself, then, you know, it's doing nobody any good and you won't achieve your objectives. I probably, that wasn't really your question, I know. But. No, that's, that's helpful, thank you. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> Anna, do you want to add anything to answer the Chia's question? Uh, no, I agree with John that um, scope should not be ambivalent. It, it should really be very clearly stated. Uh, so go back to the to the guidelines. It it could be the you know the, the the general guidelines of the funder, or it could be a specific scheme. And this should answer the question about scope. So you should really be confident, either positively or negatively, that the project fits or not. If for some reason it's not clear, then ask them. Um, you should always ask for clarifications. You know they they usually respond. Um, and if they don't want to commit to a, something, you know, then they won't. But at least you will have some kind of answer. I think what is more, what is trickier to do is to, to actually, you know, um, make sure that the kind of interdisciplinarity you're proposing is something that they can grasp, depending on the kind of panel, depending on how they pick reviewers, um, so I'm not familiar, maybe John maybe can speak to that. I'm not familiar with the UK RI uh, schemes. I'm familiar with the European ones as a, as a grantee, but also as a reviewer, as a remote reviewer. And so I can speak to that. And I can assure you that if you go for a European ERC kind of grant or a Marie Curie grant, um, that they will pick the right reviewers and that you will have, <clears throat> you will have the scope of expertise even if it's not represented in every single reviewer, which you shouldn't expect, but they will pick the range, the right range. They will go up to eight reviewers if it's necessary, uh, but they will pick the right range to be able to assess if it's solid, you know, at, at different levels and if the whole thing makes sense. So this is why it's very important, you know, to have a very clear idea of whether you're, you're responding to the right call you're going for the right ground because you're putting a lot of effort. A lot of it is just figuring out what you want to do. And a lot of it is just fitting it with what they want. Um, and if it doesn't work because of a, this, you know, this junction between what you thought they wanted and what you gave them, then that's really frustrating. So try to, to clarify the picture as much as you can before you go in, because it takes a lot. It's very energy, you know, sucking this, um, this kind of application. Okay, on, on the UKRI side, and I'm sorry if I'm telling you stuff you already know. Um, so you are allowed to suggest some referees and they, they generally use a couple of them. Um, uh, but they don't even, even if you think, okay, I know these people, um, okay, there's no conflict of interest, but I'm pretty sure they'll respond to the, the call. Sometimes they don't, I've been on a number of uh, these committees over the years. Um, so sometimes um, they will sort of rather find people a bit distant from, from you. I, I think a very important, um, when I used to apply for more US grants, uh, I was told, um, only as a co-I, but was told, don't assume anyone's heard of you. Now that I was early career, so there's a safe assumption no one would have heard of me, but they said it also counts for people who are more established. 
um, don't make any assumptions. This, this is actually very important because the, the people who do review your grant application, even if they do know who you are, the chances are that people on the panel might not. There's only a limited range of expertise on these um, panels. And you know, one person might be expected to cover a whole area of, of science. Or, you know, so, you know, I don't know, in, in my own thing, it might be there might be one person who knows about plant disease and everybody else knows about other things, other uh, biological things. So that person may not know who I am or, or what I've done. Um, so you've got to make, you know, make it very, very clear. Don't, don't make any assumptions about, about knowledge, make everything super clear. If there's an interdisciplinary uh, uh, aspect to it, make it completely clear why it's, why it's needed and why it'll take the field forward and why it's exciting. Um, and again, in UKRI, you get a chance, you get to see the uh, reviews before the committee makes a decision on ranking. Uh, so even if the reviews are terrible, always respond. The agencies, you, or the, the BBSRC, et cetera, usually give you about five minutes to get a response in there. So they need a, you know, a response by a date, which happens to be the coming Friday, which really means they want it by the coming Monday. Um, and so you do have a bit of, a bit of time. So it will be very irritating to get these. Uh, you will be hurt to the core uh, and you should just look at it for 24 hours and then start respond and respond in a very detailed way as, as you would to reviews of the paper, because these can persuade the people on the committee that the reviewer is, is wrong. Uh, but don't don't get angry when when doing it. <laughs> okay, but always respond because if you don't respond, committee will think they were right, that the reviewers were right. Thank you, John. I, <clears throat> and I'm afraid we're already at two o'clock. Um, unless there are some more burning questions or comments before we close. Um, please, is there anyone else <clears throat> who would like to ask a final question? No, that's good. But <clears throat> Sorry, uh, <clears throat> I was kind of suffocating for five minutes. <laughs> I found my, my voice back. Um, Inanna and Jordan, thank you so much for your time. And uh, if um, if you're happy with it, I'll um, I'll post the recording and give your <clears throat> leave your email address. If anyone here in the session would like to ask any further questions, I hope sure. that John and Inanna would be happy to. Yeah, of course. To answer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining us. It was it was really interesting, and um, and I hope that we will have you know something something else along these lines because I think these kind of discussions help, particularly you know <clears throat> ACR and and uh, EPIs. Thank you very much. Again, the recording will be on our website, and um, yeah, we will let you know about future events. Thank you so much, John and Anna. Thank you so much. And Thank you. Uh, have a good, good, uh, good luck. Afternoon. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone.